thank you very much all of you for joining me i'm going to do some introductions megan why don't you introduce yourself first you want a long introduction or just a hi? <laughs> just a short, let's go with a short one to start with. Okay, hi. Uh, so my name is Megan Torvald and I'm a postdoc at uh, Cardiff Dementia Research Institute. Do you want more than that? No, we can go with that. No, well, uh, although I already said that, didn't I? Yeah, you did. <laughs> so I work at the Dementia Research Institute in Cardiff and um, my interest is in how the, broadly how the immune system is involved in dementia. I'll talk about it. In a moment. You'd think my introductions would be slicker after six, nine hours. Well, um, no, I mean, I, I'd imagine they'd go downhill. <laughs> Lauren, can you introduce yourself? Hi, so yeah, I'm Lauren Walker and I'm an Alzheimer's Research UK fellow based up in the very cold Newcastle University in the Northeast. Uh, my research is um, primarily based around dementia with Lewy bodies and how we use human tissue um, to investigate what's going on in the in what's going on in the brain of patients that have this disease. I also in a previous life before my PhD was a technician for the brains for dementia research initiative. So I've kind of got experience on both sides, the donation side and how we actually use the tissue in dementia research. So it's quite a unique perspective. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, Joe. Uh, yes, I am a I'm Joe. I study at the University of Salford. I'm a second year PhD student and I'm part of the biomarkers group there and I am looking at the relationship between autophagy and small extracellular vesicular microRNA um, in Alzheimer's disease and frontotemporal dementia. FTD coming up again for a rare dementia we've talked about a lot today which is brilliant I'm sure the FTD group will be very pleased by that and Keely. Yeah so um, yeah I'm Keely Brooks um, and I am the lead for the Brains for Dementia's uh, DNA bank and genetic analysis. So uh, we get the DNA from the people that are involved in this project or volunteers for this project, um, do genome-wide genetic analysis on it, and I'm using it to see if we can use genetics to predict who's likely to get dementia so we can get them those treatments a little bit earlier and maybe prevent it all. That's good. We've had Kings and UCL talking about that as well earlier today. And am I, I'm, I'm not wrong in saying what you all have in common is brains for dementia research. Goodness for that. <laughs> uh, for those that don't know, who, who would like to give us an overview as to what exactly BDR is? I, I can't help but think that it's either Lauren, who used to work there, or, or, or Keeley. Yeah, I don't, like I, don't, I don't mind unless you went to Keely. Uh, you go for it. You work there. You probably know it better than I do. And you can add on anything I've forgotten. Okay. <laughs> um, so my experience with Brains for Dementia Research started quite early on. So I think I started as a technician in 2008, um, which I think is when BDR kind of just was, that's when it definitely started in Newcastle anyway. So I think near the beginning of it. And it's an actually it's an initiative between two charities. So it's Alzheimer's Research UK and it's Alzheimer's Society who kind of got together and decided to make this unique cohort of patients that were extremely well clinically characterized and neuropathologically char characterized. So we have the brain tissue that we get um, when the person passes away, but we also have clinical information that's collected every year when whilst the person is alive. So we have a unique, um, very well characterized um, cohort. Um, it's a network of five different brain banks, and this is going to test memory. So we've got Newcastle, where it's the Newcastle is the coordinating centre at the minute, and then there's also London, Oxford, Manchester, and Bristol. I think those are the five. Yeah. Um, so it's a network across all five brain banks um, that have a central store of all of this amazing um, clinical neuropath and genetic information, which is something that I have very little experience about, and there's something that I definitely need to talk to Keely about after. <laughs> And I'm right in thinking that they so uh, brains for dementia research doesn't only have uh, doesn't only involve people who are living with dementia. It's it's got brains from people who volunteered, and then some of them may have gone on to develop dementia. Some of them may have died at different times of life. Um, it wasn't a requirement to have dementia to sign up to it. Not at all times. Um, no, um, it's very important to have donations from people that didn't have any known neurological disease during life because we also need to, we need a comparison. So for someone that had dementia with Lewy bodies, Alzheimer's disease, we can see changes during the changes in the brain. Uh, but we also, to kind of quantify this, we need also 
normal healthy controls that we can actually say, well, this was due to the disease. So it's very important for controls to sign up as well. So we have quite a lot of controls in addition to patients um, that have neurodegenerative diseases. Um, and you no, know, it's not a requirement for patients to um, have a neurodegenerative disease to sign up. Um, we just, anyone can sign up as well. It just needs to be um, the clinical um, assessments just happen yearly, annually, uh, once a person hits 65. So you can sign up at any point during life. Um, we have a lot of caregivers that sign up as well, or family members of people that are kind of like joint partners, of people that have uh, had dementia during life. Um, but they don't get the annual clinical assessments until they um, reach an age of 65. So anyone can sign up. I think, it, so I had some involvement with BDR a long time ago, and I remember that uh, some of the challenges then, which I can't imagine are probably still the same now, is part of the problem is, is, of course, if people sign up in middle age, you don't know necessarily whether they're, whilst, you know, you're collecting information, which costs a certain amount of money to do that annual test, you don't know how many people are going to go on. You could get unlucky and like literally recruit people who don't go on to none of them develop dementia mm -hmm. i'm sure that's not the case but but you just don't know what proportion of people are going to go on to develop the disease and of course you do want to look at people with the disease and so i remember recruitment always kind of was was very dynamic in so much as it would start and stop at different times as you try to kind of get a balance of the right kind of people and the brains of different people so sometimes you would suddenly say, right, we are open now, but we want people who are in a very specific age bracket with this type of condition to to make sure that you balance otherwise, because mm -hmm. there's it's not unlimited resources, is it? The brain banks are quite expensive, but we have also heard today how amazing they are and globally used and how the UK has got some of the best brain banks in the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, has that changed? Am I right in saying that? So if, if you went away and looked at BDR website now, they may or may not be looking for people like you. You'd have to go and have a look and it changes. I think so. No, everything's definitely on the BDR website. So we, on that BDR website, I think you can see um, kind of which studies are kind of, or which neurodegenerative diseases or which populations we're interested in. Um, and interestingly as well, where the tissue goes. So the brain bank networks send tissue. I know that specifically from Newcastle, we've sent tissue to Australia. We've sent tissue all across the States. Um, so the reach of the brain banks and the UK brain banks is definitely worldwide. So, which is really exciting that a lot of people are getting to use this fantastic resource. And it goes along, I mean, it goes along with, mm. so, so this is, so somebody of uh, different ages sign up to the brain bank, they get this annual follow-up to get lots of information about you. So when you do eventually pass and your uh, the brain can be collected uh, it gets broken down into lots of different pieces frozen and distributed when people want specific tissue and they'll put a call in say I want very specific uh, type of brain tissue and then that can massively so right we've worked out where you're getting all your samples from let's move on to the important part now to say what are you doing with them um, I'm gonna come to Megan first and so um, Megan, Hi. when you go back to work, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sue, are you back before or after Christmas? I'm actually back on the 21st of December for three days. Okay. Which will be useful <laughs> to help my brain kind of go, oh, what do I do again? <laughs> um, so that's and, just that's three days to empty your inbox of your uh, email. <laughs> I've been keeping on top of my inbox. <laughs> I, there's no way that I was going to let that go because that's madness, isn't it? <laughs> So tell us how what what do you what do you do? Why is this tissue important to you? And what do you do with it in in Cardiff? Okay, so at Cardiff University, there's um, a huge focus on the understanding the genetics of the Alzheimer's of Alzheimer's disease. Um, so Julie, our director, leads that side of things, um, and basically by comparing thousands and thousands of people with and without dementia, they identify risk genes. So these are genetic differences that like a lot of, we all have very different DNA and your DNA and my DNA differences, a lot of them don't make any difference, but um, some of those differences can increase risk of Alzheimer's. So we identify risk genes. Um, and I'm gonna use an example throughout here, which is one of the risk genes is called CR1. And that is a gene which encodes a protein called complement receptor one. 
Um, so the geneticists identify the gene and then people like myself come along and we study that gene and we try to work out what that protein is doing, how is it conferring increased alzheimer's risk. So complement, spelled with an E, is the name that's given to a group of proteins um, that were discovered for their role in the immune system. So when you get an infection, whether it's bacterial or viral or whatever, complement proteins are essential for um, recognizing an invading path pathogen. That's what we call the bacteria that's alive. Destroying the pathogen by punching holes in the membrane. Um, and then these complement proteins come along and stick all over the pathogen. Um, and they coat it in eat me signals so that the nearby cells can come along and clear up all of the mess. So three stages there, recognition, destruction, resolution, and all of those things need to be kept in perfect balance in order to have a healthy immune response. So it sounds like I've gone off on a really big tangent here. I no, get no, that. no. I'm... But CR1, um, that risk gene in Alzheimer's, for Alzheimer's disease, is a really important regulator that helps to keep um, this process in check. So you can imagine that if there's a variant in CR1, um, which affects that balance between the recognition, the destruction, the resolution, then that can be quite destructive. So that's, that's about the immune system, but we're interested in what's going on in the brain. And so I would come along and write an application to the brain bank um, saying, I'd like to study what CR1 is doing in the brain. Um, the first thing that I need to do is show that's, that complement CR1 actually is in the brain because um, something that I don't know if it's been covered today, I've been trying to kind of dip into conversations but haven't been able to. Um, the brain is in what's called an immune privileged organ. So basically the brain is really, really fragile. So we don't want to have a big immune response in the brain that might cause damage to the brain tissue, to the, to the nerve cells that are doing all the electrical firing there. Um, so the brain exists in a blood brain barrier, uh, sorry, but in a protective sac, which we call the blood brain barrier. Um, and a lot of the immune molecules that are produced in the rest of the body are produced at really low levels in the brain. So the first question that we needed to address was, is CR1 actually in the brain? Because it could be that it's functioning in the rest of the body and we need to focus on the rest of the body, or it could be that it is found in the brain and it's doing something there. So uh, my- so And you I, can't just look at one of those, I guess. You then have to get lots of tissue samples to yeah, look at exactly. a broad range of people in different- Yeah, and so, so I write to the BDR, or in, in my case, some of my tissue comes from the Edinburgh Brain Bank, the MRC Brain Bank in Edinburgh. Um, I request tissue. Um, they send me these little lumps of frozen tissue that few centimetres. Um, and then I use a machine called a cryostat to cut it super thin. It's like one cell thick. Um, and for people, I, I feel like I would want to be able to imagine what that looks like if I was listening to this. It's kind of, the closest thing that I can think of is that membrane layer of an onion, you know, that's kind of translucent. So it, I have like this layer of tissue that's on a glass slide, and then I do um, a staining process that's it's essentially painting by numbers, but like a complicated science version. And so only my protein of interest lights up, so only CR1 lights up. And so I've done this technique on um, some control, we, people without dementia, we would call control samples, um, and then people who had dementia, and I can compare the two. And I can say, first of all, big news, and this is a paper that we currently have in submission, CR1 is in the brain, um, and then we can show CR1 is on the immune cells. And then my colleague, um, Nicoletta Duskalidou, is doing some really cool work um, with stem cells where she's trying to understand what is CR1 doing in the brain. Um, and another colleague of mine, Lewis Watkins, has been doing some, he's basically looking into what other complement molecules might be in the brain. And then we can start to piece together knowledge that we already have about what complement is doing in the rest of the body and what we know is going on in the brain and we can piece it together and figure out what complement is doing. 
to okay. increase the risk of Alzheimer's disease. That was a bit garbled, wasn't it? No, 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 not at all. So, so, um, <laughs> so CR1 shouldn't be there. Well, so it was a really contentious issue where people were saying CR1 is not in the brain, um, but it's actually just CR1 is a really fiddly protein to work with, and we weren't able to show that CR1 was there. But it's one of those. Um, but it's not there for everybody. It wasn't there. So it in is every... in it is in everybody. It's right. increased in people with Alzheimer's disease. Right. And what I was trying to get at that I feel like I didn't really communicate very well in the beginning is that there are these genetic differences that they might, they're really subtle and they don't completely abolish the protein. They don't knock it out, but they might subtly affect how it works. And so a little tweak in the protein and how it functions can affect its, its ability to regulate the pathway and so you can get a bit more destruction and a bit less regulation um, and then that can kind of snowball an inflammatory response in the brain. Which of course then we know we've we have talked a little bit about inflammation today as to what that the impact yeah. of that. Keely I'm gonna have to come to you because I'm, I'm conscious that I want to give everybody a chance to talk and there's more of you in this session. So we we, we got into genes there so tell yeah. us about your work. Um, well, um, I'm sure Megan will be happy to see that um, or hear that in the genetic work on the, the BDR, we have actually found that the CR1 gene is associated with uh, dementia uh, in our sample. And also I've done some RNA seq. So this is looking at the immediate gene product from our genes, um, some RNA. And we do find that CR1 is expressed in the brain, low levels, but it's there. Um, so yeah, so I'm looking at all these different variations of the genes um, that we think are risk candidates for, for dementia of various different types. And what um, I'm trying to do, well, I'm trying to do two things to begin with. One is um, look at um, the whole risk. So like how many of these genetic risk variants do people have? And does the number of them or the composition of them lead um, certain people to be more predisposed to dementia than not. Um, so is the, given... the long term hope of that then that you could potentially turn some of them off or on or or do some kind of gene therapy that would change the outcome? Potentially, yes. I think it's I think with dementia, the, ch the changes, as, as Megan was alluding to, are going to be really, really subtle. Um, but we may find something that we can target um, and if it just even identifies people um, that are at risk from dementia. So like the APOE, um, epsilon 4, predicts people, if we can know what the whole genetic risk is, we can identify people who are really at super high risk and maybe get them the drugs that are now being tested and are shown very positively, but they work best in people with very early dementia. So, so think, thinking back to our session, five hours ago with Mark and uh, Richard, who were talking about tau and amyloid. Mm -hmm. Is that with the view that these things would be what causes the tau and amyloid in the first place? Um, or is yeah, this on I a think, completely different track? No, I think they're probably all kind of adding to what is building up or what is leading to the buildup of the amyloid and tau in the brains. Um, where they action, I mean, this is the thing with genes. They are the same in every single cell and they are the same, give or take, throughout your entire life, which makes them a really good predictor because they're not going to change. But we just don't know where the action for these genes are. They could be in a particular cell type or a particular part of the body, which makes it very, very complex. And that's why the inflammation, inflammation system is really being highlighted because it seems to tie in both um, the body and the brain. Um, so yeah, the idea is, is to try and figure out which combination of risk genes you need to predict Alzheimer's disease. And my, I'm very similar to what Megan's doing in, in Cardiff in the fact that um, I'm trying to look what these um, genetic variants are doing, uh, probably on a more genomic level. Um, and what Megan's looking at, Megan's looking at protein and, and above, I'm looking below protein. So there's a couple of levels of gene regulation before we even get to the proteins. Um, and I'm trying to figure out exactly what these variants are doing in terms of the immediate gene products or altering how it's regulated um, by using um, the brain for dementia research tissue. So then we're going to talk about phenotypes. So Lauren, I'm going to come to you next. Uh, do, do, do you do anything like that? 
Are you doing something uh, completely different? Well, I'm... <laughs> this is the great things about brain tissue, right? We use it in so many different ways. I, yeah, you can do so much stuff with it. So my work is primarily looking at kind of the fit side, so not the genetic side or anything like that. So I look at protein aggregates in the brain, um, particularly in dementia with flu bodies, where we found that up to 50 to 70% of cases, um, so patients actually have additional Alzheimer's-related pathology, uh, which makes kind of diagnosis and how we figure out how we treat these patients really quite challenging. Um, and so my work is looking at, a co I've got a cohort of 60 dementia uh, with Lewy Bodies patients that have varying amounts of Alzheimer's related pathology. I'm kind of looking at co-localizations of different proteins. So at the minute, I'm looking at co-localizations of a protein called tau, which is an Alzheimer's disease, and alpha-synuclein, which is in characteristic of dementia with Lewy Bodies. Um, and using the tissue, kind of similar to what Megan said, kind of using the tissue book um, to cut it on a microtome. So this tissue is not frozen, it's kind of preserved in a fixative for a month, uh, but we can still really cut really thin sections. And then we can have a look at the distributions of proteins, um, how they co-localize in different brain regions, because this is very different across different uh, neurodegenerative diseases, um, and have a look to see how that affects the clinical phenotype. So what we have found is that patients that have a lot more of both proteins decline a lot quicker. Um, so it's kind of, and also have a different um, distribution pattern of pathology. So different brain regions can be affected or have different burdens of the pathologies. So we're interested in how much each individual brain region is affected. So we use a lot of, a lot of brain tissue, to, a lot of different brain regions to look at this. So yeah, with the hope of kind of. I love the way you, you went under 60, because you call them, did you say 60 patients or 60 people? I, I mean, I. I quite like that. So you you thinking about these as individuals, as people who kind of made these donations rather than, oh, I've got 60 samples or I've got 60 brains. So, and I guess is that because you know you know all the history that goes with those samples? You've got these store not stories, stories wouldn't be right, but do you know you've got information about the samples? We do have information about them. As a researcher, I have um, kind of anonymized information for these patients, yeah. so I don't get kind of personalized you information. You don't know their name. You don't have to write letters to their family members, no. No, no, I don't. Not, not as a researcher. You, you do get little notes on, on what happened to them and how they passed away, and that makes it, you really appreciate that this was a human, this was someone who lived their life. My grandma was one of the, was a BDR participant and she donated her brain. And that's one of those things where I'm like, this was a human who lived their life and they were kind enough to donate their brain to research. And that is awesome. Sorry to butt in. No, I, I completely agree. I, I'm sorry, Lauren. I'm going to have to go to Joe because I'm, I'm conscious of of time, and I want to give Joe a chance to talk about his work as well. So, Joe, tell us what. How do you use this this tissue, and what do you do? Yeah, uh, yeah. So I use uh, Alzheimer's disease and frontotemporal dementia uh, brain tissue uh, from patients, and so as you all probably know that the commonality that causes uh, each of these diseases that lead to dementia are the buildup of neurotoxic material. Now in healthy brains, uh, we, uh, we have uh, something that goes off that, such as autophagic mechanisms or our wasted systems. And in healthy brains, they work fantastically. In During dementia, these are when these become impaired and uh, these slow down and, and again, slowly stop working. And uh, there's many reasons as to why these stop working, but uh, the team that I'm working with, uh, we look at microRNA. Uh, so these are little molecules that that switch off uh, certain processes in the body, and uh, where I, I'm focusing on uh, autophagic uh, sort of influences and how these travel around our body in these small like cellular vesicles with these little delivery bubbles, let's call them. And so these are implicated in disease and travel from neuron to neuron. And yeah, so uh, what's fantastic about these small like cellular vesicles is we can uh, get them from uh, brain tissue and we can analyze the content of microRNA using uh, different techniques. And the hope is to find potential biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease and the three genetic subtypes of frontotemporal dementia. So if we can find different patterns of like a broad range of microRNA, then hopefully, hopefully uh, this could act as a potential biomarker, but 
it, and, it's all very uh, exciting stuff. But I, and I totally lot. should have paired you up with Aitana Sorgo, who was uh, Esther Sorgo, but that was on earlier because that's exactly what she's doing too. Oh no UCL. way! Oh, and awesome. on the, using the Gemfi study data from uh, Gemfi, okay. so I should have paired you up with those. Sorry about that. I, I'm, yeah really sorry that i didn't get longer to speak because i think we could have kept going on I'm, i am before i bring in the next guest i'm going to ask you what's what's exciting you i'm going to come to megan first because she's going to talk lots <laughs> i'm going to go to you first joe because you've had the least amount of time to talk what's exciting you about your work right now the most ah oh, that's a good question i get i guess like everyone like it's going into work every day and knowing that we're actually building and building and building on sort of the knowledge that everyone here is um, working towards and hopefully getting to that sort of peak of the dementia research where we can answer what's causing it how to treat it and how to effectively diagnose so it. Many, whenever you ask neuroscientists about what, what kind of enthusiasm is decided because you really are discovering stuff that nobody's ever done you yeah. see you're working in a field that's so so new and fresh and the brain is the one thing we know so little about still that you've got a chance to make a massive discovery and exactly. every time that's every time you go into the lab what, what about the rest of you um keely lauren what's well, exciting I, you i'm a i'm a genetics geek so anything to do with uh, <laughs> the genes and how they work and what all these variations do um I absolutely love, but I'm I'm really excited about where genetics is going with the, the the predictability that we can use it for, but also because it is the backbone of so many biological pathways, and those little variations can really really change things a lot. And it's re I'm really looking forward to working with various different people who work on proteins and and cells and things like that to see if I can overlay all the genetic data that I have. And the advancements the, the of te in, te in technology and and yeah. use of more powerful computing and things has made such a big difference to that to that field as well and i, I have to plug this because he's been on the podcast before um but there's a guy called chris mason that wrote did the twin study about the effects of space travel on the brain and the genes and i, I love that book i it's called the next 500 years about what how we might how genes will change over the next five years or how 500 years and how we might need to adapt people for going to space i'm waffling on now um Lauren, Megan, anything you want to flag? Megan's just going to be excited to go back to work, do stuff. And not just because you get to escape from your baby, who I'm sure you love very much and don't want to get away from. <laughs> was that just... Sorry, I had myself on mute there. Yeah, no, I'm, I have actually been a little bit nervous about going back to work, but hearing all of the talk today, I'm like, oh yeah, I really miss this. It's really great. And the DRI is going to be a great place to work as well. It's for fantastic, that, I yeah. It's really uh, Lauren? I think for me, it's just kind of the enthusiasm in the field at the minute, especially over the last couple of days of, with kind of the encouraging data from the Lacanumab trial um, and the possibility that for me as well, that this could be, it's not it's not the treatment, but it, it's a step in the great di in, in the right direction. And so for, for beta amyloid as well, oh, Oh no, <laughs> I've been sat, been sat down far too long. Um, so for amyloid beta, um, which is present in a lot of patients that have dementia with Lewy bodies, it could be repurposed for different patients as well. So I just think it's an, it's an exciting time. And I think a lot of researchers over the past week have just felt a, kind of felt this level of excitement. So And that'll bring more funding that we, we need mm -hmm. and hope. Thank you very much to my brilliant guests, Dr. Megan Torval, Dr. Lauren Walker, Joe Morgan, and Dr. Keely, um, Keely Brooks-Baker, who, who have joined us to talk about their work on pathology and brain research. Thank you all very much Yay. again. Thank and you. I hope to see you all, all again.